the Facebook files. Last year, uh, Harvard graduate and Facebook employee Francis Horgan had handed a huge trove of internal Facebook documents to, among others, newspapers, journalists, and in fact the US Senate, Senate where she came to testify about Facebook's conduct. Uh, this has gained quite some, um, you know, quite some, some attention, but at least in Germany, perhaps not as much as, as it should have. And I'm welcoming today Lena, hello, and Svea, hello Svea, who will be giving uh, a better insight into the Facebook files and what it is all about. We will be having a 30 minute talk roughly and about a quarter of an hour Q&A after that. So please do contribute with your questions on the various channels. They will hopefully miraculously appear on my screen to be transferred over the air to our nice ladies who will be giving us many insights now. If the screen is yours, very welcome. Okay, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, sorry, first of all, for my voice, because uh, I'm having the Congress flu without <laughs> Congress, real Congress, no, just, just a bad cold, but um, no COVID, so everything is fine. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, welcoming us today. Um, before we dive into the Facebook files and give you uh, in deep an exclusive um, view and insight, um, let us shortly introduce us. So, yeah, Lena, you, you go first. Hi, I'm Lena. I'm an investigative reporter with WDR and the Deutsche Zeitung in Berlin. And I mostly work on terror investigations, but also anything complex. So I, of course, jumped on the Facebook files as well. Yes, uh, and my name is Svea. I also am an investigative reporter working freelance for NDR television, mostly in tech issues and Lena and I, we worked very closely together for several weeks or months now on the Facebook files. Uh, we were in the team, we had the contact to Francis Haugen um, first uh, in Europe. And also we had, uh, to, we had the chance to look and work very closely with the files. And we did a lot of stories on these issues. And so we thought um, this would be a great time to give some behind the scenes um, views and um, to tell you a little bit what's not all in all the newspapers, um, some more details about Francis Haugen and also what's in the files and what's not in the files and how they should be read or interpreted. So this is um, what this is about. And I will now um, open the presentation on the screen and we'll vanish behind behind it. So uh, yeah, have a great time and Lena will start first. Okay, let's see. This is who we are, You, we just told you and then let's go, Lena. Um, I can't see the, the presentation. Mm, okay, sorry. Then let's just... Just to make sure that... Yes. Our audience sees it. Yes, sorry. Okay. Now... This should work. Who is Francis Haugen? Okay, Lena, you go first. So, who is Francis Haugen? Um, most of you have seen already, um, but in the beginning, it wasn't so clear. In September, when in September 2021, uh, the Wall Street Journal started publishing a series of articles and podcasts under the name of the Facebook Files, um, the leaker was still anonymous. The reports were riveting because these journalists from the Wall Street Journal had were using hundreds and and thousands of internal documents from Facebook's internal employee network. Um, and only after a few weeks, it was announced that the leaker will cooperate with Congress and the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and reveal their identity. And um, by then we were already talking to Frances in video calls. Um, she appeared on the screen as a very normal woman our age um, with headphones and on her couch. And um, until October, um, the beginning of October, we knew her under a, a code name. So until she really re revealed her identity, she was also using a code name with us as journalists. And um, uh, yeah, we learned that, that she was 
37 years old. She was born in Iowa. Um, both her parents were professors, um, but her mother later became a priest. And Frances went on to study electrical and computer engineering at a small um, college named Olin College in Massachusetts. And she later became a data engineer uh, and product manager, first at Google, mainly working on Google Books. Um, then she got a, a job at Yelp and Pinterest. Um, and then in um, two th 2018, um, she got offered a, a job at Facebook. And first she was very hesitant, she told us. Um, because of Facebook's reputation for being an engine of radicalization and because of the personal experience Frances Haugen had. And let's listen to her first. Um, this is a clip from our interview with her. Yeah, let's try. Right. So why, why, why do you do what you do? So I came into Facebook. Als ich bei Facebook anfing, hatte ich starke Vorbehalte gegenüber der Plattform. Schließlich hatte ich einen Freund, der sich 2016 mit Hilfe des Internets radikalisiert hatte. Und ich dachte sehr schnell, oh mein Gott, das Problem ist sogar noch viel größer, als ich dachte. So as, as we heard, um, when she arrived at Facebook, um, the disenchantment or the Uh, the, the problems she saw um, started immediately because um, immediately she saw that what she had thought of Facebook as an engine of radicalization was even bigger. Um, and with her personal experience, just to explain that, in um, a few years back, she got very sick and she had an assistant who later became yeah, almost like a brother, a very close friend. Um, and she lost him to the rabbit hole. Um, Uh, his journey started, um, yeah, on normal social media sites and ended at 4chan and led him through the universe of conspiracy myths. And she told us that she was shocked that she lost him, um, like that he was unreachable for facts um, at some point. She wasn't able to have a conversation uh, with him anymore. So when she got offered the job and 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 was able to the job at the integrity team, that it, it, uh, the team at Facebook that was formed to protect the U.S. Um, election um, and working on civic um, integrity, um, she uh, really um, thought that she could make a change. Um, but she realized um, that um, that the company, she said, didn't want to change. Um, Although she really and, and admired her co-workers, they, she said they were really smart and creative people, but she said the leadership didn't want to listen. And so in the end, after about two years, she became a whistleblower. And um, when you talk to her today, you can see that it seems like she's the perfect person to do that. Um, she seems really at ease with her role and she's found her role also to be in the public and to put a face on the whistleblowing. Um, she says her, both her parents are professors and it feels very natural to her to sit and explain things to people. And that's what she does now, as we will see later. She's really touring um, the world to get her, her message out. And also we learned that she has a photographic memory, a very good memory, and that she's financially independent because she invested in crypto in the early days. So, um, yeah, um, She seems to be, yeah, a, a, yeah, a whistleblower, um, uh, almost um, as drawn, yeah. Um, and but let's go to her motivations. Why, in the end, she wanted to become a whistleblower. So these are uh, two um, clips from our interview again, um, and she told us that when she was at at Facebook, she, I was faced. So uh, this is how this, um, citations. I, I was faced with information that I believe put many, maybe a million or 10 million lines in the, on the line. I sat there and if you were staring down at a situation where you believe maybe 10 million people could die over the next 20 years, and I knew that I had the information that could potentially save even a fraction of those lives, she had to do something. Um, and she says, it's not about bad people or, or bad content at Facebook. It's about a system and like either the organization incentives or the incentives at Facebook. They are, they, they are wrong. 
they are skewed. Um, and then also she says that she failed to change the system from within. Um, she, she realized this problem was so much larger than even I thought it was. I kept trying and trying. And at some point, I read the realization that there was enough systematic problems that I would have at some point figure out how to bring the information to the public. So she tried actually to, to, to make her complaints heard in the company, but she had this, the, 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 she was under the impression that the leadership didn't want to listen. Yeah. Um, and um, I think with this uh, things you have now learned about Francis Haugen, I think if you know all these things, you can understand the league much better. And um, this is what we're going to do now. So um, we will dive into the files. And if you have all this in mind, so what was her motivation, then you will now see and understand better why some things are in the files and why some things aren't. Because you know now why she did what she did and what type of person so roughly she is. So let's go uh, to the Revelation timeline just sh just quickly. Um, here in uh, December uh, 2020, she worked into the civic integrity team, but this team got dissolved. And there was a Wall Street Journal reporter And he um, saw a chance and um, asked all these, all the people who, who worked there and he tried to get interviews with them. And he also got in the chance to meet Francis Haugen and probably um, in the podcast from Wall Street Journal. Um, he tells the story that uh, they were talking to each other and um, yeah, probably this also, yeah, get uh, confidence that there's somebody she probably could talk to and We assume that uh, then she started collecting the files, but this stays blurry. So maybe she started earlier, but um, this is something not which is not really known and uh, which is not really answered clearly. So she's always when we asked her, she was always speaking from summer. So summer, summer. Maybe this is the summer 21. Um, then the Wall Street Journal stories got out, and I think what's also interesting here to see is that you have this time period from December to September. yeah. So more than half a year um, is from the first contact from the reporter to the leakage. So I think this is quite interesting. And then um, you have the filing to the SEC and to US Congress via Whistleblower 8. We will talk about this later too. And then things get rushed and then things get... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, Q, um, each, uh, or then the everything gets very fast. So there you have the filing, then you have the revealing of the identity. And on the 5th of October, she is speaking uh, to Congress. And then all the publications, maybe you all have read or some of them you, you have read, um, went out. So it's pretty interesting to see now. Um, oh, yeah, and then we also implemented when we come in place what was in the beginning of October. This is where we broke the first story and then formed the EU consortium. So we thought maybe what's the most, what's probably most interesting for you here, guys, is not the question what's in the files. <laughs> maybe we will tell about this later too, but what not, what's not in the files? Uh, maybe this is the more interesting question. And so uh, to to get the answer to that, it's um, really important to understand the nature of the files, where the files come from, um, and about what kind of files we are talking when we are speaking about the Facebook files. And as Lena already um, mentioned, Frances Haugen was a, a data scientist within Facebook. She worked with the civic integrity team, and later she worked with counter espionage. So she was a regular Facebook employee. She had she hadn't have a high rank or something. She wasn't part of the board or she wasn't an executive person. So of course she had limited access to documents. Um, but yeah, luckily for her, uh, Facebook maintains a quite transparent approach regarding its own research and a lot of other relevant information. Probably a lot. Tra more transparent than other companies. So you 
you have in Facebook, you have some kind of internal Facebook, which is called a workplace. And in workplace, you find a vast, vast amount of um, internal research reports. And people are discussing this research uh, with each other. And But I must admit, so in, in this research there, you have a lot of technical terms and you have a lot of teams speaking to each other and the research is made for Facebook employees. So, of course, it's full of um, abbreviations or yeah, terms um, you can't or hardly understand as an outsider. So we will get into that later. So to give you a glimpse of, yeah, how is a file, how, how are, what, what did we see when we dived into it? So you have these totally unstructured PDF documents with more than estimated 10,000 pages. They are all photographed. And um, there you have this uh, research and also these discussions. And uh, you see here where I did the pink um, arrows, you can see how it looks. And it looks a little bit like Facebook. You have groups, open groups, and you have comments, you have smileys. And then you have these black redactions, which were made later on because all these files were made for Congress. And so all the names um, were redacted. And this uh, this is pretty important to know when you think about what the files don't tell. So what's missing? As um, I told you um, that Frances Haugen, she was not part of the executive board. So it is not in the files what Mark Zuckerberg or other key executive know or not know, as these are not reports directly to Mark Zuckerberg, as these are research reports for the internal network. So they don't say much about leadership or about decisions from leadership or what was discussed by leadership. Sometimes um, you have these postings in the internal Facebook where leadership is discussing something. So you get an idea or a glimpse what the board thought or what high rank executive thoughts. But this is basically something what the files are not telling. Um, then the Facebook files don't provide any context. <clears throat> and this is something I, uh, what also Frances Haugen thinks, what yeah, really is the reason why she gave all these files to journalists, because she hoped that we could pre provide context. Because uh, there are no information on who did the report. So usually the author is redacted, so you can't see... Is he a good researcher? Is he long working with Facebook? Or what What has he got for an education? So you don't know how reliable they are or what happened before the study or after. So um, I think this is very important. And we especially saw this. I don't know if you remember the reporting on the Instagram study. And when you read the Instagram study very closely, you see that the that they are talking about a dozen um, people who they have conducted um, interviews, qual uh, qualitative interviews with. And um, this is a research which is highly qualitative and not quantitative, so it's not representative. And so this is uh, very important if you look at the files, that you look on the numbers, how many people... Um, with how many people a study is conducted or um, with how many accounts or how how, how, how many, um, uh, yeah, what what is it really about? And then you also see in the file that there are specific areas which are very well represented, like hate speech. I think this is an issue. Francis Haugen worked a lot on it in the civic integrity teams. And other areas are missing or not represented. So, for example, um, I'm very interested in fake accounts. So this was the first thing I did when I was swifting through the files on what is uh, what research is there on fake accounts. There is some research, of course, but um, yeah, I, I was I was missing um, I was missing content, and I thought, oh, there need to be more. Or about scam. I don't know if you know love scams. Though I did not find anything about this or click farms. Then engagement numbers, there are some engagement numbers, but not that much. Or So I 
Um, I can only speculate about why there are some areas very well represented in the files and some aren't. But I think probably there are different reasons. So um, on the one hand, Frances Haugen, she had a specific time, a, a limited time to get these files. And also um, probably she had uh, limited areas where she could go and um, read these documents. And also, of course, these are internal research. Um, this is internal research. These are internal studies. So there are only studies where Facebook employees thought this is some kind we definitely should investigate. And if there's no, if they didn't feel the urge to investigate it, of course, there can't be a file. So these are some reasons, I think, why some areas are missing. Okay, so now let's get to the good part. So what's in the files? I think um, some of you are probably have... Um, read or heard about the Wall Street Journal revelations. So we do not want to dive into this because this is broadly known about that celebrities were treated differently, that human trafficking um, goes on on Facebook. I don't know who watched the Jan Böhmermann. Uh, he, he did again talking about this. Or that Instagram was toxic for teens or Mexican drug cartels using Facebook or that Facebook changed the news algorithm and polarization got worse. So these are the these were the first revelations. So let's talk about growth. So this was something I was looking into it because I'm pretty interested in the whole fake accounts area. So I looked into growth and I found it pretty interesting because uh, Facebook is always speaking about growth and that um, they are growing and making more and more profits. And of course, this is true. But if you look into the files, then you can see that um, young users, especially users under the age of 25, that these they are, the numbers are decreasing. And this is what you can see here uh, pretty closely. Uh, you have the red line and then you have the blue line. This are uh, symbolizing the younger users under 25. And even in COVID times where you have uh, on the right uh, corner, you see the spike <laughs> in all the other um, age groups, especially I think people above 50 got highly interested in Facebook during COVID. No, just joking. So you have every age group is highly is uh, using Facebook more um, during COVID, but um, not so the people under 25. And this is pretty interesting because of the filing for the SEC, the person of Sicht, yeah. <laughs> and uh, because uh, what is with the advertisers and is Facebook really telling the truth when they always talking about growth and profits? Then I think hate speech, pretty important. And there are a lot of case studies about um, especially poorer countries or high-risk countries and that there the polarization goes on and that um, Facebook is not taking enough measures, um, especially for sub-languages um, on the for, for on Arabic countries or um, uh, um, Asian countries where, or African countries, even worse, where you have often a lot of dialects and a lot of languages and that there are not many people um, doing, for example, content moderation. And one of the probably most difficult documents, but I think one of the most interesting ones is this one. So sorry, I, I think you can't read a lot, but I will explain. Is this um, report. It's called the OPEX report. And um, it's, it's really a long document with a lot of numbers, but I liked it very much because there were so many numbers in it. It was quite an official document and not only a study one researcher did. And um, in this uh, OPEX report, you can see the misproportion in spending money to fight misinformation between English-speaking countries like the U.S. and ROW, uh, ROW this is rest of world. So you see here on the document on the right, you see on the first column, you see misinformation. And then you have these rows. And then on the row, the right corner, you can see that uh, money or man hours, this is uh, transferred into man hours, that 84% man hours here is the first 
quarter, quarter, quarter of 2020 that 84% is spe was spent for misinformation and rest of the world is 16%, which if you compare the US to the rest of the world, you can see, definitely see where um, the focus, where Facebook focus lies. And this, of, this also was one document Francis Haugen pointed us through and said, you have to check the numbers and then you can see what I mean when I say they are, um, yeah, gr profit and growth is more important for Facebook than human lives. So I hope this very, um, <clears throat> yeah, this document makes this clear. Okay. Yeah. What does Facebook say? Facebook says, no, we're doing a lot, of course, and everything. Um, the uh, yeah, people using Facebook, this is really important to us. Okay. And now uh, for the last part, I give, uh, yeah, Lena will um, tell you something more about the fight with them. Yeah, thank you very much, Svea. So what is really interesting to us is to see um, the discussion in the work culture, um, the discussions among amongst teams and amongst employees. And you could see that in the chat um, that was going on, especially under some of the studies. Um, and it was kind of confirming our impression that Facebook, that there was a lot of debate, internal debate, and that there was a lot of frustration. Um, amongst employees, because as we have counted, there were at least 11 major leaks since 2016. Most of the, the leakers remained anonymous, um, but there were also some that have been uh, that went public. Um, for example, Sophie Zhang went public in April uh, 2000 and, uh, 2021, and um, um, that was just a few months before Francis Howard came out. Um, uh, became uh, came public and um, made made it public that she had leaked a document. So Hizeng had not leaked any documents, but she had talked to reporters, and uh, and and she her her when she ended her employment with Facebook, um, she um, said she posted a badge post. This is kind of part of the internal exchanges, and we found many of these badge posts. Um, um, she posted. I have found multiple blatant attempts by foreign national governments to abuse our platform on vast scales, to mislead their own citizenry and cause international news on multiple occasions. And she was, just as Francis Haugen, she was concerned with, um, with Facebook's lack of content moderation and lack of enforcement of community standards outside of the U.S. Um, so this is just to show you that, that, um, Internal debate was very um, was very public internally. So, I mean, um, we found another badge post. Um, it was called "Leaving Q and A." Um, it, this was from May uh, 2000, um, uh, from May 2021, um, and there, this person was concerned about um, hate speech. Um, and this person said she couldn't take it anymore to, to be an Facebook employee because she says, with so many internal forces propping up the production of hateful and violent content, the task of stopping hate and violence on Facebook starts to feel even more Sisyphean than it already is. And she means internal forces, meaning the leadership. And this is something that, or this person um, um, says, um, so many internal force, forces um, the leadership, this is something that Francis Howden was also really concerned about, that um, on the one hand, there are people working on combating hate speech and, and, and changing the algorithms to make it a more, a better and, and, and safer environment. Um, and then on the other hand, there's, there are some forces in the, in the company that apparently work um, against these efforts. And this fight that we could see, um, could you go back? Uh, this fight that we could see was especially um, uh, viral after January 6th, after um, the, the, the storm of, on the Capitol. Um, and their employees were very much discussing and they were very, they were furious. Um, and one, one person says, 
said, we've been fueling this fire for a long time and we shouldn't be surprised. It's now out of control. So employees are giving Facebook responsibility uh, for the development. And another person said, employers, employees, uh, it should say, employees are tired of thoughts and prayers from leadership. We want action. And another person says, so many research back ideas get shut down. We need to do a better job at, at making decisions from a research first perspective. And this is something that is also very close to Frances Haugen. Um, she says in our interviews, she says, there are solutions. There are, um, uh, 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 there are wonderful employees and wonderful teams who are working to come up with with solutions, but they are uh, uh, they are blocked by leadership out of a for profit interest. Um, and this is uh, uh, here a screenshot of another um, person saying, "I'm struggling to match my values to my employment here. I came here uh, hoping to affect change and improve society, but all I've seen is atrophy and ab abdication of responsibility. I'm tired of platitudes." I want action items. We are not a neutral entity. So employees seems to be extremely critical uh, of Facebook. Um, yeah. Um, so as a general for a takeaway, um, you could say that uh, we expect to see more leaks from Facebook. We expect to see more whistleblowers coming out of this work culture because people seem to be extremely frustrated. And this is also, just to, to wrap it up, this is Facebook's reaction to the Facebook files and the revelation that came out after October 4th, um, after, after Haugen um, went public. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg said, we, in, an, in a message to his employees, he said, we care deeply about issues like safety, well-being, and mental health, um, and the coverage uh, rep misrepresents our work and our motives. Um, and uh, Facebook's communication VP, John Pinetti, said um, even that it was an orchestrated campaign against um, Facebook. Um, and in response to our reporting, he said, we welcome scrutiny and feedback, but these documents are being used to find a narrative that we hide or that that um, that was cherry that, that we hide or cherry pick data when in fact we do the opposite. So they are uh, they they are kind of blankly refusing Francis Haugen's um, uh, accusations. But uh, uh, let's see um, what ha what happened to Francis Haugen during this process. Um, as Sophia explained, she was talking to a reporter um, uh, early on, and she was on her own. Um, but when sh when she started um, when when the when the revelation started in the Wall Street Journal, apparently we don't know it. Um, könnt ihr euch? Um, you know. Um, sorry, I'm hearing the sound from the sea base. Uh, that's why I was a bit confused. Um, but in the process of leaking documents, she um, she can't she got in contact with whistleblower aid. Which was founded by a former whistleblower, John uh, Tai, um, uh, and which is a nonprofit legal organization um, claiming that no one should have to risk their career or their freedom to follow their conscience. Um, and some of you may know the executive director, it's Libby Liu, uh, former CEO of Open Technology Fund. So they help Francis making uh, uh, protected, protected uh, uh, disclosures. And she also had um, lawyers who um, represent her. Um, they are from Bryson Gillette. It's a consulting firm and a law firm founded in 2020 by Bill Burton. He was a former spokesman, deputy spokesman of Obama. And um, the, the Bryson Gillette is also involved with the Lincoln Project. So they are clearly from the democratic spectrum. Um, and this was also why Facebook could easily make the claim that it was an orchestrated campaign by the Demo Democrats, an or orchestrated political campaign. We think that, um, but let's let's go on. There are more groups involved with Francis, just to, to, to wrap it up. Um, there's also Luminate Group, um, which is funded by Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay. And also Ben Scott is in, in, involved there. Um, he's a former policy advisor for innovation at the U.S. Department of State. And Hillary Clinton was 
um, was there. And they have cooperating closely on funding, um, for example, Reset Tech, uh, operating um, also uh, in the US and Europe, the nonprofit lobbying, lobbying organization um, that wants to regulate the market for big tech. So these organizations, they come from the democratic spectrum. Um, there's no question, but we see that, or we think, and our impression was that they were matching, matching Francis uh, Hagen's uh, interests. So they had kind of the same um, uh, goals. So they came they came together in the process. Yeah, really important to see now. Okay, what's next? So we have reported on the Facebook files uh, in Europe, in the US, but it's yeah pretty exciting to see. Um, yeah, what is happening? Is uh, Facebook changing something or is there any regulation coming? So, of course, the, the future is um, still open and not written. But to give you a little bit of a glimpse what happened after the 7th of October. So then, yeah, uh, Frances Haugen went on some kind of tour through Europe. So she was in London. She was in Lisbon. Lisbon. And in November, she went to Berlin to Brussels and to Paris. So why did she do that? Why did she travel from Puerto Rico to the US and then from the US through Europe? Um, I think every three days, another city, it was a, a tour like kind of for, for a rock star or something. Why did she do this? Yeah, it is because, um, yeah, they. she clearly has some kind of agenda. She definitely wants something to change and she did not want to throw a lot of documents in the internet and then hide uh, in a castle or somewhere else. Um, she definitely wanted something. Yeah, she, she wanted action. So um, she had big hopes um, in Europe because um, as probably some of you know, um, here the Digital Services Act is debated, uh, was debated in the parliament and now it's up to the commission. So hopefully next year, um, the Digital Services Act um, will be in place. And uh, yeah, she and also uh, many uh, groups are hoping for more regulations and control regarding especially content moderation, fines, and also transparency so that you can see what is going on on these platforms. And uh, in the US, um, the hope lies in Congress and in the SEC. So um, I think she, they hope that the SEC will have a million or billion dollar fine on Facebook and also probably pushes for more regulation. And the discussion centers around that users getting more control of their data, um, that, that there's more transparency and probably that also there's more taxation probably on digital ads just yeah to to make the business model harder because i think also this is only one way to come by um is yeah to to do something on the business model okay so yeah we hope you enjoyed our presentation and we yeah want to thank you uh, for listening and also big thanks to mm -hmm. the team who worked with that and i hope we have another 5 to 10 minutes for some q and a yes Thank you. Uh, yes, we have indeed another 10 minutes before we have to prepare for the next talk. Thank you very much for this, these 45 minutes of content. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very well. Well, uh, you, you, are, you are giving the impression, you, uh, your presentation gives the impression that Facebook is basically rotting from within. Uh, it's a question when mutiny within the Facebook workforce will break out and uh, that 85% of all the content comes from payments for the ugly content and not uh, for, for the good one. Uh, how true is this? How, how evil is Facebook compared to other uh, debated evildoers like Telegram or, or others? Uh, what do you think? Um, I, I think, uh, that, you know, the, the Facebook files, uh, you, you have like the feeling that, um, you are in a submarine 
and you're mm. diving into the marine, you know, mm. and you're di diving on the other water, and yet then you go with a light bulb, you know, with one light, and then you shed into the dark, and these are the Facebook files, and you can't see what surrounds this. So I think we definitely, so I think it's it's not fair to say, like, the whole company is so or so. It's only fair to say that in these, what you can see on the comments, for example, after the um, storm on the Capitol where, where many employees um, were, were speaking. So I think it's not that the whole company is rotten from within, but of course there are parts uh, which are rotten. And this, I think, is shown in the files. I think it's really hard to compare Facebook to Telegram or Google or something because I think... A Facebook or a Meta, uh, as they now called, it's quite a very unique player on the market. They are, um, yeah, they bought uh, Instagram, they bought WhatsApp. You can't compare Facebook or Meta to Telegram because this is a completely different scale. So, um, yeah, that's that's. I, I hope I could. It's a little bit a philosophical question, so I hope my answer is okay. <laughs> I, I mean, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to add. Um, I think it's true. Um, uh, what we said, we we are only seeing a glimpse of, of course, of of um, the internal discussions. But it gives us an impression, and I think um, the impression I would see, I would see, is right that there is a lot of frustration amongst employees because what Facebook says on the outside, like we are good, we we are connecting people. Uh, whatever their slogan is, um, uh, is not. Is, it seems to be not confirmed um, by uh, by many employees. They 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 think just as Francis Haugen um, thinks that um, the company is putting profit uh, over safety, and 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 there may there there are probably a lot of employees that are super happy to work at Facebook and they don't see it. And I think that they have amazing. Um, perks that they get at the office, you know, they get have little kitchens. They have, I mean, it seems to be a, a wonderful place to work at. But if you care about these issues, um, it seems that many or many people who really dearly care about these issues, such as hate speech, such as dem democratic processes, mm -hmm. such as uh, foreign um, influence on elections, um, they seem to be very frustrated. So, as I said, I expect more whistleblowers. I expect more leaks to come. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's a structural thing. Just to add this, um, it's a structural thing. They, they're when you compare it, for example, to Twitter, um, it seems to be that Twitter is doing many things much better than 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 Facebook. But as again, as Sophia says, you can't really compare it. But there's, there is a there is a discussion within the the, the Facebook files about a firewall between those parts of, of the company that are enforcing um, policies, internal policies. And those parts of the company who are responsible for the for the numbers and who are selling um, uh, ads, for example, and uh, apparently at Twitter there's a fi there's a firewall, um, mm. but at Facebook there's no firewall. So the same people who are who are selling ads are also making um, exceptions for political actors um, on, on 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 certain behaviors, mm. and there's um, this is a structural thing that frustrates many people. No Chinese wall. I see. Uh, I'm getting signals that we have only three minutes left. Uh, a very short uh, question and a very short uh, answer from our technical audience. Uh, you talked about the internal platform workplace, the, uh, Facebook's internal knowledge base. It would of course be interesting to see how user levels, uh, access controls, encryptions, uh, rights management work on this platform. Is anything in the uh, leaks about that? No. No, oh, only um, research reports. Okay. Only vast amount of research reports. Mm -hmm. But this vast amount seem to be accessible. Okay, somebody's waving, <laughs> waving us goodbye. I see. Thank you so much. Interesting insight, interesting updates. Uh, folks, follow this issue. It's not over. Things will be coming. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Svea. Uh, I wish you, you good, good health through the winter and uh, thank you again <laughs> for your meritable effort here. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Seabase. Bye. Everything is uh, licensed under uh, CC by 4.0 and it is all for the community. To download for everybody.